data management, uh, current research in policy and education panel. I'm Spencer Corrales. I'm a Council on Library and Information Resources postdoctoral fellow at the University of North Texas Libraries. I'm here today with Martin Halbert, the Dean of Libraries at the University of North Texas, Rachel Frick, the Director of the Digital Library Federation at the Council on Library and Information Resources, and Bill Moen, the Associate Dean for Research at the College of Information at the University of North Texas. Um, the, we've got these three projects are interrelated. I had the privilege of contributing to the research on two of them. Um, and uh, we, since we have a fairly short time, I'm going to keep myself out of the picture as much as possible um, and let the presenters go. Um, we'll be starting off today um, with Dr. Moen. And thank you again very much for taking time to come. Good afternoon. Um, it sounds like we're getting audio here, so you can hear me back there, OK? Yes? OK, cool. Um, I want to just do a brief uh, project overview on a current IMLS-funded initiative that we have going at the University of North Texas. And there is um, some handouts on the three chairs over there. There is a small brochure like this for our project. Feel free to pick one up on your way out. So um, this project is a three-year effort in capacity building. Uh, started in September. Um, <clears throat> at the university, and it's funded by a library for librarians for the 21st century grant. And it's important to recognize it's a strong collaboration between UNT libraries and the College of Information. Uh, Martin is co-PI on this project, and as you'll see, there's another one that's coming, uh, that's being reported on, where uh, there's also a collaboration between the College of Information and UNT libraries, and it's very uh, fun to be at a place where we can have such strong collaborations between these two units. So the goal for this uh, um, project, which we've called ICAMP for Curate, Archive, Manage, and Preserve, is to develop curriculum within the Department of Library and Information Sciences graduate uh, program to increase the number of trained professionals and disciplinary research, and I'll come back to that in a minute, uh, for digital curation and data management responsibilities. Uh, we have a few courses that sort of touch on that in our graduate program right now, but we are planning to provide a graduate academic certificate of four courses in this arena funded by IMLS. Our objectives are this four course sequence, uh, web-based, they'll be fully online, um, at the end of the project, uh, we're designing uh, them to be pretty much online from the get-go, but we're say, uh, requiring students to be able to attend some on-site sessions, more in the sense of assessment and debriefing and some participatory design in the first or two offerings of these. The plan is that each course will be offered at least three times in the course of the three-year project. We develop, deploy, assess, revise, refine, deploy three times for each of the four courses. Um, we're also um, trying out some new technical infrastructure because of some issues related to questions by folks at IMLS and other places about to what extent are these online courses that library and information science graduate students or others um, really leading to um, skills and hands-on experiences and practical training that, um, in the same way that they might have had they been in a residential program using computer labs on campus. So um, I'll come back to that in a minute as well. And then uh, this teaching environment that sort of aligned up with the, um, the technical infrastructure. So in a way, um, we're kind of presenting an early kind of framework for what we're doing. We have a competency um, focus for the basis or foundation of the curriculum, and we've identified seven groups of uh, competencies, and I'll touch on those briefly in a minute. The four courses, and then this learning environment, multifaceted and multi-technology learning environment, with the outcome being um, the um, you know, the information professionals equipped with knowledge and skills to deal with digital curation and data management. We target four or three groups um, 
One, our traditional graduates in um, information science, in our library and information science program. But we have about a thousand uh, master's students spread around the country, many, uh, several, a number of cohort groups around the country. And we need to provide this training, not just to the residential students in, in, in a face-to-face -face environment, but to all of those students that are interested in it. We're also looking at post-masters information professionals who, who need and want to be retrained for new responsibilities in this area. And we think one innovative aspect of this uh, project is that we have funding for 15 stipends to bring in disciplinary graduate students who may have data management responsibilities in their futures, um, such as someone in biology, um, history, wherever they might be, but are not library and inf information professionals but our hope is that by them taking one or two courses in this sequence alongside LIS professionals in training, that they're going to be rubbing shoulders with their future collaborators in terms of data uh, management and digital curation. Um, our outcomes um, that we foresee this uh, curriculum having increasing students' preparedness by enhancing practical training, and that's part of this virtual lab teaching environment that is uh, um, essential to our, our curriculum, and also trying to assess positive change in disciplinary specific graduate students' perceptions about the library and about the information profession and their willingness and um, uh, understanding and need to collaborate with information professionals in their future research lives. We also hope to set up some models for how to do technology type courses better in an online environment and also then showing how the, the power of the collaboration between LIS education uh, and information education with university libraries or libraries in general in terms of collaboration on projects. So our driving question in some ways deals with how can we improve the nature of LIS education? Um, how can we improve new ways of preparing graduate students um, to deal with these amazing opportunities and challenges uh, related to data management, digital uh, curation, and preservation? Uh, the competencies, let me just briefly talk about those. Um, we see our curriculum being based on a set of competencies. As we have worked in the last four or five months in this area, we see the breadth of responsibilities that could be involved in data, uh, data management, uh, digital curation re, um, uh, functions within an academic library and across the university. So we are trying to identify a set of competencies that our courses will address and that we can um, fully uh, achieve those competencies, the students can fully achieve those competencies through these four courses that we're developing. Now that means that there may be other competencies that are needed out there that we're not um, um, expressly able to um, deal with in these four courses. That's going to be coming out in the next three years as we test out to see what we can manage to address in four, course, four graduate courses. Um, the competency groups, um, we are including professional skill type things such as communication and interpersonal um, uh, 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 communication as well as environmental scanning, things that um, these students need to be ready to do lifelong learning in this environment as things change so rapidly. Just, uh, you know, thinking back to the presentation at the plenary session, the changes that are, that are happening right now, the new second uh, revolution in information technology, these sorts of things are really um, going to be um, shaping the roles and responsibilities of these folks, as well as more traditional and expected things such as curating and preserving content, the technologies, and service development around digital curation and data management. Our curriculum development, we have four courses and we're looking at a variety of pedagogical and instructional design uh, frameworks so that we can make the most out of the time and effort that the students are putting into the, um, the, the work of the four courses and we'll have uh, 
The first two that will be offered this summer are digital curation data management fundamentals and then one that's focused on the technologies, uh, tools, applications, and infrastructure. And these two will be, um, be in very much in line as things are covered conceptually within the first course, there will be activities in the technology course to um, bring into, uh, bring to bear um, the skills and knowledge to use the tools and technology. Um, the final course, we're just labeling it as a seminar right now um, as we start developing the third and fourth courses next fall, that, that one should take more shape. And then finally, the last thing I want to mention and talk about is the technology. Um, this is one area that I feel very excited about and I think there's innovations uh, related to the curriculum here. We're going to have um, three types of learning environments, technology-enabled learning environments. One is the traditional uh, learning management system. Uh, we are, have just uh, released Blackboard Learn for use as our enterprise system at the University of North Texas. And we see that as providing traditional kind of guided, directed um, study for the students. You know, lectures will be up there, uh, some communications uh, delivering their assignments and so on. Um, but what is the area that we are most interested in exploring in terms of supporting student learning is the virtual lab environment. For the last several years, starting with a um, IMLS grant a number of years ago, dealing with uh, botanical specimens and a workflow for dealing with botanical specimen data, we've been using Drupal, Islandor, and Fedora. Islandora was developed at the University of Prince Edward Island as a connector between Drupal and Fedora. And we're seeing how we can use this as a platform for student engagement um, where they will be dealing with a real life repository where they can be putting things in, taking things out of the metadata creation, all that in a safe environment while having all the functions or a selected set of functions of a content management system like uh, Drupal for web publishing. So we have the announcements and the calendars and the forum and, and things like that. So <clears throat> we're very excited about seeing how we can leverage this particular uh, platform for student uh, learning. We are also, by the way, using the same platform for the project's web presence. And this allows us to have one web um, platform for um, project management that is uh, protected from the public view, while at the same time having all the data that we want to make public from our project easily made surfaced as a public facing thing by flipping the switch in the repository. And then finally, the third piece, again, this is where the collaboration with the libraries is really important. Um, we will have a sandbox of the technologies and applications that are used in day-to-day -day operations at UNT libraries. Again, a safe place where the students can carry out problem-based learning and using the tools that um, Martin and his staff use on a daily basis for preservation, uh, curation, metadata, and things like that. So we think that the students are going to have a very rich technology-enabled learning experience in these four courses. Um, and just finally, the list of staff. Um, there's uh, three co-PIs, uh, myself, uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Library and Information Sciences at um, UNT, and then Martin, and then several uh, professional staff, a research scientist from my College of Information, and then two folks from the UNT libraries. And um, we have four student positions right now. We have uh, four pay, uh, graduate research assistants, uh, two of which are filled right now. We are um, uh, recruiting uh, two replacements for people who have left. Um, thank you very much. Hi, I'm Rachel Frick. I'm the director of the Digital Library Federation at the Council on Library and Information Resources. I'm going to quickly um, give a brief overview of what we've been working on at CLEAR for the last year in regards to data curation education. Most of our activities have been around a Alfred P. Sloan founded um, foundation funded activity. It was a planning and research grant to just investigate what is happening in uh, data curation education. And when we say data um, curation education, I'm trying to say, we're really focusing in on um, data management plans, uh, researcher needs in this particular field. So at CLEAR, we really felt that developing and maintaining skills in data curation 
must become a central part for professional, um, central to the professional identities of specialists in each discipline if our educational institutions are to build robust, efficient, and appropriately integrated online environments for future research, teaching, and learning. That's a bit of a mouthful. Um, with that thought, we had some certain assumptions. We assume that most graduate programs in the sciences and social sciences, as well as the humanities, are not well prepared to cultivate the data management skills of their students, or sometimes even have to teach them why such skills are important to their survival of their fields of study. And that in every discipline, at least some professionals must come to, to, the, to grasp the complex demands related to the creation, access, reuse, and preservation of digital research data. And in the past, this has been in the purview of the library and iSchools, and especially this, um, and also computer science. So we were wondering, how do we begin to stake out or put out some signposts for a new professional identity? Who are these people that are going to be managing our research data? And with these questions, in April 2011, we were funded, like I said, by Alfred P. Sloan to investigate this and, and look at these questions and recommend a path forward. And in our minds, we were trying to figure out um, how do we build community around this new professional identity? Where do we, how do we identify training and educational opportunities? And what could CLEAR do moving forward to help kind of build this professional capacity? That was a little bit different than what we've been seeing at the iSchools, but come from it from a more discipline-centric um, perspective. So we gathered together an advisory board. We have the names of the folks there. As you can see, a lot of them come from our iSchools across the country and have been involved with research data activities up to this point. And we decided to do two particular studies. One was an environmental snapshot, just basically just a click, a moment in time, what data curation um, education programs are being offered in the iSchool. What do they look like? What kind of um, certificates do they offer? Are they open to non-LIS students? Once again, just kind of getting a shape, uh, a look and feel of the um, landscape. The other uh, research study was more of an ethnographic study of people who are currently working in data curation positions at higher education institutions across the country. And we wanted to take both those studies, look at them, as well as other things that are being published in the field, because there's so much being published in this area right now, and try to make some recommendations on how CLEAR could support future education and training opportunities, as well as inform other people who are thinking about developing these types of programs. The environmental scan was done by Spencer here at the University of North Texas. And like I said, it was to describe LIS programs, as well as what we're calling extra academic those post-professional opportunities and uh, other alternative models and then make recommendations to clear. Highlights from that particular snapshot, once again, it was, I want to say this was a click moment in time. It was not meant to be in robustly comprehensive for everything, but it's just, it's just a nice kind of a way to kind of get situated in the landscape. But we realized that only five LIS schools um, offer dedicated programs for digital curation or data curation. It was that actually gave somebody a certificate that this was their concentration. That um, there was a growth of certificate programs open to non-ILS students. Um, and actually just, I'm backing up just a wee bit. Um, since 2006, I mean, I don't think this is any surprise, but the Institute of Museums and Library Services, through the Laura Bush 21st Century Library Professional Program, distributed more than $6.6 .6 million in grants to develop this data curation capacity in our library schools. So um, one of the things I think that was really helpful that Spencer kind of bubbled up for us was this uh, data curation skills matrix that Cal Lee authored back in 2009. And what was really interesting about that was that he was able to break down just um, more like functional areas or what we're calling four meta level functions of data curation. And this breakdown, um, of data creation know-how as opposed to theory was um, helps inform and I think has spurned the development of a more modularized skills-based curriculum that we're starting to see come up um, out of our uh, um, LIS schools and as alternative programming. So there's a link there. It's really, really interesting to look at. And also we're starting to see um, 
data curation programs coming up in museums, which I think is really great coming to bubble up because there is a lot of research data within our in our museums and other cultural heritage institutions. So that's an interesting growth that we're seeing in that area. Once again, this goal of this environmental snapshot was to provide a resource guide for us as we think about, when I say we, clear um, future education and training programs. The other study we did was an, um, what we're gonna say, an environmental, well it wasn't, it was a, a ethnographic study of data management and curation practice. So um, the goal of this study was to identify barriers to data curation and um, unmet researcher needs within the university environment, as well as gain a holistic understanding of the workflows inv involved with the creation, management, and preservation of research data. So the investigators, Lori Yonke and Andrew Asher, conducted the interviews with faculty, postdoc um, post fellows, graduate students, and other researchers in a variety of social sciences disciplines. Again, for those who are involved in the data curation field, I don't think these key findings are very surprising. I think it's really nice when you kind of get another hit of what you think you already know. Um, that in regards to training, none of the researchers they interviewed for this study received formal training in data management practices, nor did they express satisfaction with their level of expertise. Um, they felt that they were learning on the job in an ad hoc fashion. In regards to preservation, few researchers think about long-term considerations of their data. And um, a lot of times the demand of publication outweighs the demand of assigning metadata or any type of rights or giving you any, even writing a code book to help you understand it later. They only think about that if, and it's only interesting to them if it helps them with their research work. Collaboration and data sharing, there is definitely a need, and I think we all know this, for a more, effect, more effective collaboration tools and spaces that support the volume of data generated and provide appropriate privacy and access controls. This leads me down to the last bullet, um, not the last one, next one. It was um, basically some of the things that uh, researchers would rather risk data loss than actually um, inappropriate data exposure. Does that make sense? They would rather hold on to it than um, and that way have more control over it. And that researchers in general, and I think this um, notion is backed up with a previous Ithaca study a long time ago about um, science e-journals or journals in general, that researchers view libraries as a dispensary of goods and not really a locus for real-time professional research or support. So putting this all together and the recommendations made in the secondary study that, um, like I said, this this falls in line with conventional wisdom. There is unlikely to be a single out-of-the-box solution that can be applied to problems of data curation. We know that. Instead, an approach that emphasizes engagement with the researcher and is a dialogue around identifying or building the appropriate tools, and I thought that was interesting, for their particular project. It's, I don't even think it's something that we can you know, stratify out to a specific discipline. It is really almost project specific. Um, that research must, researchers must be given access to adequate network storage. A lot of times they heard over and over again that they just did not have the network storage to place all their data, so it was running around on thumb drives, on uh, you know servers in their department, underneath their desk. It was just all over the place because they couldn't get it, they didn't have enough storage allowance on their university's network storage. Or, the other hand was, they were working with um, multi-institutional partnerships and their networked policies wouldn't allow people from the outside to have access to the storage on that particular university's network. That, um, the other recommendation is that education and other training programs that focus on early intervention in the research or career path are likely to have the greatest benefit and that data curation systems should be um, integrate with active research phase, like if you're backing up or doing collaboration work, or built into the tools that they use, kind of like um, the project that's going on with Microsoft Research and California Digital Library about enhancing Excel in order to facilitate data curation. And once again, the privacy and um, access controls that you know ethical risks associated with inappropriate data release outweigh the risks of data loss. 
I kind of ran through those studies really, really fast and bring kind of cursory. They will be published in two weeks on the CLEAR website. Once again, the environmental scan was a snapshot. Um, there's some really great gems in the ethnological study. Um, but those two reports together, we reviewed those and then combined them with, once again, what we were looking at and seeing what was published in the field, what the IMLS was funding around data curation, education. And we developed a follow-up proposal back to Sloan. Once again, how do we start developing this professional identity around um, data curation that isn't so hard and fast coming from the LIS school, but can be seen as an alternative approach coming from the discipline side. Because as you can see, researchers really align themselves with disciplines and not their institutions. And we felt that the network of data specialists that are supporting data curation should also be similarly aligned to the disciplines. And that they should be integrated into the research team. Um, I saw a presentation by Susie Allard at the Research Data and Archiving Preservation Summit the other week down in New Orleans, and she said, paraphrasing completely, um, that those data specialists really need to be at the elbow of the scientists and be right there as part of the research team. But what's really interesting by developing that data specialist that also has an understanding of what's happening in the library and IT, they can also serve as an advocate for the researchers to, um, I guess, broker within those local systems. How do you go to IT and talk to folks about, can I have more network storage, or how important it is to have this multi-user access to a certain portion or a cold room, someone was talking about, of, of, of data so people can work together. And that, um, and this is the part that CLEAR really um, feels a passion for, is that this should be a defined professional path and not a secondary career choice. Um, I remember seeing a presentation done by Saeed Chaudhary. I really didn't think he'd be in the room. Um, it was a couple years ago, and he had actually said something like, somebody's going to have to take a hit for the team in order to manage the data. And we feel that is absolutely true. But when that phrase, taking a hit for a team, that seems like almost a negative commentation that this career path um, you know, is kind of a, a substandard path choice when we really think this should be a first choice. You know, there, by signposting this out, it could be just as a valuable career choice as being the researcher itself. So going back to the Sloan grant that we just received um, on March 20th, we're really excited about that, is that we're going to expand the existing um, clear postdoctoral uh, post um, fellows and academic libraries program to one that, um, to, to have a subset, so our concentration in data curation. We're gonna be able to fund six positions focusing on sciences and social sciences. Um, we have a nice advisory board, but what's really interesting about our advisory board, they're helping us not only vet applications for the positions, but also they're gonna serve as mentors to these individuals as they work in their, at their host institutions. So they'll have a host, they'll have a mentor that's from their discipline but also a mentor that's from a data curation side, so they can help them, guide them. I think one of the things right now that was the biggest challenge for our data curation professionals is that they tend to be one person or two people in an institution, and they are often feeling alone or set adrift. So how do we start building these connections between um, mentors who might be in their iSchools as well as this growing community nationwide? Going back and connecting to the growing data curation community, when I was talking to Susie Allard and some other people involved with Data One and Data Conservancy, there is a lot of outreach and education um, activities in those two NSF DataNet um, funded proposals. We want to work with those projects as well as some of the other newly funded DataNet projects that are doing some education and outreach in this area to connect those threads together and make sure we're not building siloed communities of data curators, but also just trying to knit them together. So we're working on activities and how do we invite people in, how do we send these postdocs to these other events so they can meet their other colleagues and peers. We're accepting applications for those six postdocs now until June 30th. We're going to be reviewing applications on May 1st and there's a URL right there at the bottom for more information but there's also handouts out by the door by um, the ICAMP flyers. We have positions at these at our six institutional partners, they're Indiana University, 
Lehigh University, McMaster University, Purdue University, the University of California at Los Angeles, and the University of Michigan. I um, really invite you to click on the URL and, and look at the position descriptions there. I put up just um, a brief example from Lehigh. The reason why I really liked all these position descriptions, when we went and asked folks to, um, kind of like it was a really tight timeline to get this in for the, this year's postdoc um, uh, cycle, we were telling them what we did, the, the results of our research, and the idea of having this person that stands in between the library and the data center, or the library and the researcher, kind of that liaison role with a discipline focused. And as you can see with the Lehigh position, it's one that's focusing on earth and environmental sciences. It's working with web and GIS folks. It's, I'm sorry, the font is really, really small. Um, but it, it, it's standing in that sweet spot in between. So it's really, it's not so tightly bound up with the library, but it's more, it's more situated with the researcher. And the other five positions are very similar. So, you know, as all good people do, once we get one grant, we try to plan for the next one. So our plans for 2013 is to expand the program with more fellowships um, and to actually expand those to possibly include um, positions that are in the humanities as well as the sciences and social sciences. For 2013, once again, connecting with other efforts as, there, as we know about them and, and doing a lot of outreach and communication about this program because we feel it's really important to stay in step with what's happening with the LIS schools. We don't want to see this as something competitive. We don't want to see this as something that's distracting from the overall effort, but we want to see something that's complementary and supportive of the larger data curation education efforts. We're also going to be seeking host institutions for the next round of uh, postdocs. That'll be for 2013. So if you're interested, please contact Krista Williford. She's here today. Raise your hand, Krista. Her email is below, but we also have a link to the press release that has more information about that program. Um, I know I whipped through that, so if you have any questions, I guess at the end of the panel or by online. All right, thanks. Hey, folks. Okay, I'm here to talk to you about the Data Res Project. It's an um, investigation of the emerging landscape of research data management practices and policies in the country and has a, a lot of interconnections with the other projects you've just heard about. Um, we're now at the midpoint and ready to share some of the initial findings and outline where we're going with the project. I first want to give you know credit where credit's due. Um, here's a list of some of the principles in the project and I want to particularly commend uh, Dr. Corrales and my strategic projects librarians Shannon Stark for the work they've done on this. They've done all the boots on the ground work of analysis in these um, in this project so far. Um, Bill and I are co-PIs on the project, but also Rachel and, and Claire should also be up here listed. They are also playing various roles in the project that I'll talk about in a moment. So you, you would have had to have been living under a rock for the last two years to not understand the motivations for this project and the prominence and criticality of, of data management in the emerging research landscape today. Um, you know, everyone heard the, the comments and the great keynote by Dr. Duderstadt this morning about big data. Um, you all, so many of you will have seen the webinar in the last week by the heads of several major federal agencies, NSF, NIH, many of them, you know, talking about the administration's new programs and importance that they're placing on, on big data. Um, this project was intended from the beginning to try to get traction on this emerging landscape and to study both the, the agency, the funding agency priorities, mandates, expectations in this area for research activities in the country and also the emerging institutional responses and interventions into data management that are coming about as a result of this. Most saliently, we're trying to figure out, well, okay, where does the, uh, the extended library and information science profession go from here? How do we respond to these new needs and requirements? And, and what's the best, uh, what are our hopefully best practices that we can identify? 
Um, it is a collaborative project between the University of North Texas Libraries, the UNT College of Information, and the Council on Library and Information Resources. And we, we're also obviously working with many institutions around the country to delve into what their practices are. So our, our first methodology, I'll first talk about um, what we've found out, uncovered, in studying institutional responses to these mandates, but then I'm going to delve into a little bit of the detail uh, that has emerged from a close analysis of the, of the agency mandates or requirements and also some focus group discussions with both groups of stakeholders. Um, first, you know, our, our initial methodology was to follow the money. So to first look at the agency, the institutions rather, that have, re have been the biggest awardees of the biggest recipients of awards from both the NSF and NIH. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, there's a lot of overlap between those institutions. When you look at the top 200 NSF awardee schools and the top 200 NIH awardee schools, it produces a set of about 220 institutions. Um, maybe the first surprising or not so surprising finding was that in that group of 220 institutions, 72% of them do not have any institutional level policy or really even guidance governing the retention and sharing of research data. Um, so the response of most institutions to date is still pretty scattered, pretty um, non-existent um, in a, at an institutional level to these mandates. Um, in looking at the 50 to 60 institutions that had some kind of official statement about research data management at, a, at a, either a policy or guidance level, we, uh, we found some interesting things. Um, and we're delving now, we're focusing more on this smaller group of institutions where there was a, a coordinated, systematic sort of response to the requirements of, of the new federal requirements. Um, first, the, the biggest single group that we did find about 30 institutions at which the libraries in the, in the institutions have stepped up to provide the support and guidance or have been the most prominent in responding to those needs and putting out uh, you know, either explicit uh, tools like the, the CDL tool that's been developed in conjunction with other places, you know, around helping people develop a data management plan, um, other kinds of instructional sessions and uh, v kinds of inter interventions to help schools and the researchers in them respond to the new data management requirements. We did find uh, seven institutions at which support is provided by the Office of Research or the campus IT organizations. And in some of these cases, there were close or at least ostensibly close cooperative relationships between these different groups to try to come up with a consistent and coordinated support uh, set of services for uh, uh, research data management. So one of the things we're doing now is doing closer analysis, more interviews with these schools to understand how the, their responses, the ones that have had, it's not surprising, I mean the, one, the institutions that are sort of the farthest along on these areas are ones that you would expect, you know, that get a lot of federal dollars, um, places like Purdue, Minnesota, and others. Um, the, uh, the interesting, you know, as we delve into this, we're starting to suspect that many of these more coordinated programs came about as a result of the NIH requirements that came out before most of the other agencies. And, you know, as far as we can tell, were received without a lot of the same sort of level of ripples of, of, uh, of you know, surprise and, and un uncertainty that some of the other federal agencies mandates were received with. Um, we, we think that the, um, you know, well, that led us to study, well, okay, what are the differences in the different agency mandates and how have people, how have institutions responded differently to them? So, you know, we actually used a, a number of research methodologies to, to first study the agency, either mandates or requirements, or in some cases, just a form that you have to fill out as a part of a, a grant application process. And while some of these, these, we use text analysis tools and various things, and the thing that actually worked the most as a heuristic, as an immediately accessible kind of heuristic to look at these 
uh, mandates was something as simple as Wordle. So we put the, uh, the requirements from these different agencies through Wordle clouds, and it was sort of interesting. I'll talk just a moment about each of them. So this is the, uh, the Wordle that emerges from the final NIH statement on sharing research. And, you know, what's interesting here is just obviously the prominence of that, those two words, data and sharing, which are not as prominent in the other agency uh, requirements. We think this is, you know, largely because of the long history you know, of regulation of data and study outputs in the medical community. Um, you know, the, uh, there have been requirements like HIPAA and, and obviously IRB requirements uh, in medical research for many, many years, and we think that this prominence and this sort of focus on data, research data sharing that comes out of and is, is you know, obvious in the Wordle cloud from the NIH policy is uh, perhaps not surprising given the, the background of the medical field. Okay, so then we'll contrast this with two other federal agencies, and it's, um, and then talk about the, the focus group discussions we've had with both institutions and the agency reps about them. So this is the wordle that emerges from the, uh, the NEH uh, requirement. Big prominence of data, you know, big focus on data, and to a lesser extent data management. You'll see a, uh, an acronym that appears in there, DMP, data management plans, that was a big part of the NEH uh, discussion of this. Um, you know, what this says to us, if you know about the, hi the recent history of NIA and EH, um, they've been focusing a lot on, you know, new digital humanities endeavors. They now have a new division of digital humanities, and they're really focusing on trying to understand what data means in the humanities, how you manage data, how you curate it long term, all of the kinds of things that, that both Rachel and, uh, and Bill were talking about. Um, we also analyzed the NSF requirement. This one is a little more diffuse or at least balanced between different terms. There's no one term that rises quite to the same level of, of prominence as is in the others. Actually, the uh, one term that we took out of this because it was such a, a preponderance of occurrence was the phrase NSF itself. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to give NSF and Amy back there and other NSF officials that are, might be in the crowd a hard time. What, what we understood from this is that there is a shift that, you know, came about from a lot of careful planning in NSF to try to get to a more consistent, long-term uh, understanding of data management and, and managing research data rather than simply, you know, doing your research and then promptly proceeding to lose your data. Um, a lot of when you delve into the text of this set of requirements, what emerges is trying to, you know, have a, a teachable moment where you can have a conversation about why you need to preserve research data over the long term with researchers that perhaps have not thought about this as much. Now, when we had focus groups with NSF officials, Amy and, and others included, um, one of the things that was surprising to us uh, when we contrasted that with the focus groups we had with researchers and librarians is there, there may be some disjuncture here in um, you know, where, where the impetus for this is coming. NSF is very much expecting the standards and the, the best practices to emerge from the community. Um, whereas I think a lot of librarians and researchers somehow think that this is, uh, you know, that there's some secret agenda in the background of NSF officials' minds of what the best practices are. That's not the case at all. NSF is looking for c the community to step up to the plate and develop the best practices for long-term data management, which again begs the question, well, okay, where is the community going to go with this? Um, I will um, speed this up a little bit in the interests of time and having some discussion because I'm very interested in hearing from this crowd about your thoughts on research data management. Um, but let me just say a little bit about some of the activities that we have undertaken in the course of this project and where we're going to go with this research next. So I've mentioned some of the focus groups that we've done to date, and we've had quite a number of them now in sort of close conversation with different stakeholders in the entire research cycle. 
um, starting with funding agency officials, but then going on to researchers, uh, librarians, IT, uh, special, IT specialists on the campus that are in charge of managing data, but also officials like provosts and vice presidents for research that whose job it, it is to f lead the academic community in how they, they conduct research and presumably where they're going to go with uh, the maintenance and curation of the outputs of research over time. Okay, to, the, and those focus groups have been very illuminating, as I said, we're going to continue doing them and doing them in a more targeted way now that we've gotten some broad results that we can zero in on specific institutional responses and the differences between them. Um, we have, uh, as a, this thing that we're doing right now in the project, a, uh, a primary survey of all the different stakeholder groups that we're looking at, some 12 different stakeholder groups. And um, we have a, uh, a little QR code for the survey. We're encouraging everybody to, to take it. I don't know, are these distributed around the room, Spencer? OK, so you should have access to one of these little things in a, in a handy way. We would, we, we've already gotten about 200 responses to the survey and are beginning to analyze it. And we're going to be closing that how, next week. So please do, if you get a chance, um, you know, fill out the survey. Uh, we are very interested in the responses and the perspectives of all the different stakeholder groups in the research cycle about data management. Um, we will follow that survey once we have a chance to analyze its results with a secondary closer survey of some of these administrative officials because we do want to get at the question of, well, how is this question of managing research data being prioritized in the very challenging landscape of funding that you heard about from Dr. Duderstadt this morning? When institutions are, you know, sort of beset with uh, a raft of priorities, that none of which they can fund, how are we, well, are we going to step up as institutions to the very challenging uh, requirements of managing a whole new realm of content that we haven't historically done a very good job of managing yet? Um, we're then, you know, we have already done some key informant interviews, but we're going to continue with those as a way of zeroing in on more detailed uh, findings. Um, finally, a couple of the final three deliverables from this project that will be upcoming, I'll, I'll talk about individually in a couple of slides. First is an upcoming symposium that we're hosting on open access and research data management. And Dr. Myron Gutman, the uh, head of the NSF Directorate for Social, Behavioral, and Economic Sciences, will be our keynote. We also have uh, provosts, again, VPRs, scientists, and uh, data management specialists from different parts of the uh, data curation life cycle speaking at this event. Um, I think it will be a very significant set of conversations. So um, please, if you, if you do want to come, please, you're welcome. And on the second day, a, a group of diehards from this group will get together and try to come up with some more prescriptive statements about data management. Um, you know, going beyond the, the sort of the level of, well, these are our minimal requirements, you know, we hope we do these things. Well, ideally, if we could step up to the, the highest level, the most prescriptive level, what we would like to be able to do, what would that manifesto for research data management look like? Um, we're going to take a stab at that and develop it as, as in the course of this project. We are also in the process of, uh, we've now put out a call for proposals for the culminating event of this project, a symposium that's going to be held as a pre-conference to the fall DLF meeting this year. Um, it will pull together peer-reviewed papers from uh, major practitioners and thought leaders in the country on research data management practices, policies, responses, and interventions in a volume that will be published as a clear report, ultimately. Um, the submission, you know, requirements and information are, are listed there. 
Okay. Yeah, let's wrap up. Um, that's it. So let's go to uh, Q&A. Steve Gass from MIT. And uh, Martin, I have a question about your project. I was curious as to whether you considered analyzing the responses to the RFI from OSTP yeah. in December as part of the work yeah. that you're doing in this project. We, we absolutely have, and that's a great um, point. The, um, you know, there's so much information, so many responses coming out right now. Um, we all, as a field, are trying to feel our way through this new landscape. Um, there are a lot of things that we are looking at analyzing, but those are the, um, you're talking about the, the couple of different requests for information, requests for comments that have come out. There was one, the White House um, RFI, on, on data management and digital curation topics. There was also the request for comments on the NSB, the National Science Board, uh, recommendations to NSF that, that went out not that long ago that were, were received. Both of those are things we're, we are looking at analyzing. We just haven't gotten to it yet. We're trying to, first, the next step we're trying to get through is our, our primary survey, but we are gonna be looking at products like that. Other questions? I have a question for the audience. Yeah, um, if I could see a show of hands of if you're at an institution where you feel like you have at least a, a coherent, you know, on, you know working uh, research data management uh, program. Okay, just a smattering of hands. Yeah, that's about right. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? As a follow-up, it would be interesting to hear what your definition is of a coherent work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I, I want to hear, I want to let Spencer give a, a, a shot at that because he's uh -huh. done the most close analysis. I think things. it varies greatly depending upon the research needs of the individual institution. Um, I think uh, the, in some cases, the what the responses we've seen range from like a little links page where they say here's the NSF's um, guidance to researchers and that's it um, to very robust programs like at Penn State and um, MIT and I think MIT's goes back to uh, the NSF or the NIH mandate in 2003. Um, uh, Minneapolis or the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis provides workshops for continuing um, credit for PI status as part of their program, and that's through the libraries. So um, I think some of these responses will be driven by the demands of the researchers on the campuses, um, and it's going to vary widely from um, institution to institution how robust they actually need to be. You notice I did not hold up my hand. You know, part of the uh, impetus for doing this, <laughs> this project was honestly a self-interested one of informing us in preparing to, you know, come up, develop a, uh, a such a coherent plan, because we don't, we definitely don't have one yet. Yes. Shirley Baker, Washington University in St. Louis. This isn't a question, this is a comment. Uh, for those of us who are feeling our way in the dark, this is a very encouraging set of reports on research, and you begin to see the, how the landscape might form, and we might actually get our arms around this. Good work. Thank you. As much as anything, these, you know, particularly the data res project was intentionally proposed because we knew that the landscape was going to be changing a lot in the next two years and we wanted to do an a activity to sort of capture that as those changes were happening. So we're taking notes of when particular events and things like the RFIs that have, and RFCs that have come out recently and other responses out of both at the, both the federal level and the institutional level are happening and how they, you know, it's a, uh, an ongoing dialogue that, you know, that builds on itself. I, I think that we can look forward, I mean, this is a really seminal time if you sort of think in a, a, um, a metaphor of a, an orbit. Uh, you know, we're sort of at perigee right now. So anything that we do to change, anything that we do to lay in new capabilities will have the most effects now 
because we'll be able to build on the efforts that we do now, the, the investigations that we do now, in ways that will inform where we're going as a field. Yeah, Trish. Hi, uh, really great presentations. Thank you for all this wonderful work. Um, I just wanted to point out that uh, Data One um, has done two surveys that people might find useful. Um, Carol Tenapier and Susie Allard, would, who Rachel Frick mentioned, um, they surveyed attitudes by researchers who are managing and sharing data. And that was, that was in PLOS, so if you go to PLOS and just uh, look for Tenapier, you'll, see, you'll find the article. But they recently um, did a huge survey of libraries and librarians, and um, that, that work should be out and available very soon. So that should be a nice window into some practices. That's wonderful. Great. Thank you, Trish. Um, Elizabeth Long, University of Chicago. This is really for all of you, though, I think particularly for Rachel. I was really um, glad to hear your comment about wanting to make data curation, you know, a real career path, not a kind of, you know, oh, I have nothing else to do kind of career path. Though it is something that I think a lot of students are feeling, and I've certainly heard and seen this, and more than anything, seen people interested in figuring out, well, what do I do if I can't get a job, you know, as an academic in, in my field? And they're not finding the right advice among their faculty. And there, there was, a, you know, an example of this is, is um, about a year ago, maybe a little less, Fermilab had, uh, um, was hosting a um, data curation workshop on, in, in HEP data. And you know, it, the field itself is very split between kind of what the role of sharing data is, you know, data curation, et cetera. But there were certainly a group of people very interested in it. And there were some who themselves were talking in this way about that. And yet what you could see were a lot of older faculty not seeing how that was a career path, not seeing in fact, or even in some ways aware of the fact that the young people in the room were sitting there saying, we don't have any other career path, what do you do? I've had humanities people come to me asking about this. So I guess really what my question is, is what can our field do, especially given what some of the comments made today were, which is this needs to, in many cases, be embedded in the disciplines, not necessarily in libraries, to help generate the right kinds of you know, new programs, new ways of giving graduate students advice in the disciplines to give them some kind of career path so this doesn't become what they come to when they're about to graduate and they suddenly say, what else do I look for? I think we're trying to figure that out. Yeah. I mean, I, not to say, you know, um, Clear in the past with its postdoc program um, is, has tried to find these alternative careers for our academics because what was it, only 20% of pe uh, people with postdocs actually have teaching jobs and we tend to keep on minting them. So how can we, but there, uh, there is this crucial piece standing between the disciplines and our libraries and our data centers and, and um, I'm going to call out somebody that I got to meet in the last year, um, Carly Strasser. She works at CDL. She was getting, I think she has a PhD in biology, if I'm correct. But she said, you know, here she is putting stuff on Petri dishes and going, there has to be something more, you know. And she just stumbled upon this job at CDL working around data curation. She's actually one of the um, key people working on the Excel project with Microsoft Research. And it was just having that conversation with her. And she said, you know, if I just didn't, if I hadn't stumbled upon this and met all these great people and see this exciting work where she felt like she actually is making an impact and a contribution moving forward, she said, you know, I had no idea this was there. So the challenge that we're seeing is how do we start really just putting stakes in the ground and saying, go this way or go that way. And also working with our um, LIS schools and, and, and working with them and showing how we can open up the curriculum for folks to go and, 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 and seek out these programs. So it's, it's, it's really just wayfinding right now and, and trying to bubble up some of the things that are happening. I know um, there's some education stuff happening with Data One. I think Trisha is going to tell me about this. But it's, 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 uh, there are some things happening right now. And, it's, and a lot of times it's just keeping track of what of all the good work that's happening right now. And so when people do have that question, you say, go here or go there or contact these people. Yeah, and I, I think. A, I have a little bit to add to that before 
we I'll let Trisha go first really quick. Go ahead, Trisha. Uh, well, just uh, really quickly, um, one thing that I hear a lot, and, and I agree, Carly is a wonderful person, and, and we wouldn't have found her unless we kind of bumped into each other. But one thing I hear a lot from um, colleagues around the UC system is they would like to hire a person, a data curation person. And this is going to sound really silly, but they're not quite sure what the job ad should look like. You know, what, what do you put in a data curation? And so, you know, we kind of have this uh, little stable of job ads that we've been shipping around. So I think that would be something really helpful for the community to say what what are the kind of expertise that you're looking for and what does that job ad look like I know that seems silly but that's not silly at all it's it's absolutely central to it what is the preparation you know for for somebody in that role and you know and look well and I know you, you did a lot of analysis of the job ads bill do you want to say anything about that well, um, I think again there's ways that we're trying to figure out what this landscape looks like for work and the responsibilities and um, the document that came out about it almost two years ago now I guess it was maybe a year and a half ago the harnessing the power of digital data um, where the matrices and the appendices I thought were very an interesting way of showing the varieties, varieties of entities and personnel involved in data management data activities and so I think, you know, there's going to be this uneasy time going forward. We're trying to figure out what set of competencies we can actually address um, without getting into data science in a way, um, which is another realm, but depends on how you slice the, slice the pie. One thing I would like to suggest, though, is I think that, you know, we're trying to have conversations with administrators, uh, administration, university administration, to talk about the, you know, this um, incredible value of digital data and digital scholarship. And as we start to see maybe a new discourse in the academy around the value of curating data sets, I mean, what's an article versus what's a data set, um, the value, the reward structure, possibly as uh, along a parallel track, we not only help define new job opportunities and career paths, but we also see a reward structure within the academy that, uh, that acknowledges the importance and the vitality of the data that is going to power the sorts of things that we heard in the plenary session earlier. And Spencer, you had yeah, a Yeah, I think we also need to be better at speaking to the disciplines. Um, you know, it's one thing to, for us to come together at CNI and DLF and talk to each other, um, but we should be um, proposing panels on, pro, you know, thinking about data management to uh, the MLA, AHA, ICPSR, you know, there's the, they need to, we need to do outreach and let them know what we're good at um, so that, and help them understand what their needs are better. And um, I actually, Corey Jackson, who's another clear fellow, and I just proposed a panel on, uh, on data management to MLA. So fingers crossed that that gets picked up. Um, go ahead. Uh, good point. Uh, I'm Tom Wilson from the University of Alabama where we are literally in the midst of building the necessary on-campus partnerships to have, what was that phrase you used, Martin, a robust, um, sustainable uh, <laughs> data um, uh, management or curation program. Um, I have a couple of thoughts. I don't know that they're necessarily really questions. Um, and at the risk of irritating some of my colleagues in certain sub-disciplines of the information sciences, I will proceed anyway. Um, I'm a little concerned that, uh, well, a, a couple of things. One is that we truly believe a single individual can take care of this uh, process for an organization. In my decades of dealing with a variety of library issues. I've rarely found that to be the case. Um, and a more recent historical experience that we've had as a broad community is with digital library programs. Those are not a one person. They might be a one person, but in terms of ideally, they're not a one person kind of thing. Um, nor would you necessarily find one person who had the uh, desired background. So I would ask that we not approach uh, data curation or data management in that regard either. Um, I also think we, while we, curation is a good shorthand term to use, historically that has been um, affiliated primarily with the archival community 
And while certainly that community has much to offer in terms of practice and procedure, uh, data management is not the same as curating a special collection. It's very different. Um, and again, I think maybe the answer to that is a team approach. The third point I'd like to make is that while I'm all for establishing um, educational opportunities for, say, pre-professional um, people coming to us either with a disciplinary background or with a perhaps more, somewhat more traditional library or archival background, but I'm also interested in what we're doing for people who are already in the tracks. Um, we're not always in a position to be able to say, oh, we're going to hire some direct person directly out of a graduate program with a certificate in digital curation because we, we may not have a position that's open. So how do we uh, get in and work with our existing faculty and staff to bring this understanding of what are the principles that need to be applied here and how do we, how do we deal with this? Um, and I might add also that a piece that probably most library schools are not good at is informing people how to deal with the politics. And being at the central core of this in my institution, there's an extreme amount of politics involved here. Well, you said it, Tom. I mean, I'll ditto everything you, you just said. It, um, you know, with as many different sub-disciplines within librarianship in the traditional sense, why would we think that, you know, data science, something as, as complex as this emerging, you know, totally new, you know, fractionated, you know, type of, of digital of content would be would be any simpler or, or something that we could consolidate into one position. And absolutely we're having to, you know, grow people that are in our staffs in an existing way. So yeah. Uh, very Absolutely. good points. And I think that was one of the motivations behind the expansion of the postdoc program because we know it's going to be a spectrum of professionals and somehow this, this network of teams coming together to handle this problem because it is so complex. And I think we're cutting into valuable coffee time now. So um, <laughs> we thank you very much for the discussion and we'll be around all week. So thank you.